Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials video number three. This is on genetic drift or random evolutionary change. Um, what I'm going to talk about in here is how we can get changes in a gene pool. And so this right here represents a gene pool, and, and then these represent the alleles inside that gene pool. And so let me start it going for just a second. And so... Um, Inside here, we've got the original population. Uh, if you weren't paying attention, I could write some of this stuff out. Uh, so we had a p-value and a q-value. Uh, p-value is the allele frequency of the dominant. In this case, let's say the dominant is red. Um, and the q-value is going to be the recessive. And so in the first time, we've got um, 10 and 10. And so our p-value is going to be 0.5 and our Q value is going to be 0.5. So that'd be in the first generation. Now we randomly choose or we have sex from, from that original population to create the second generation or we get this remixing of the genes and you can see in the second one that our allele frequency has dropped quite a bit. It's now uh, of the dominant we have 0.3 and of the recessive we have 0.7. On the next one, it even drops more. Now what's making it drop is simply chance. So now it's 0.15 and 0.85. And now it goes to 0.2 and uh, 0.8. And then eventually it goes to 0 and uh, 1.0. And so what we've seen is a drift, or just due to random uh, size of the population, we get the elimination of that red allele or that red um, color. And that's genetic drift. Um, if we were to graph that out and we were to put um, the p-value here at 0.5 and 0.5, and I were to graph that, let's get it in the right color. The p-value went from 0.5 down to 0.3, down to uh, 0.15, and then up to 0.2, and then eventually it dropped down to zero. So this would be zero here. And then if I do the blue color, um, the blue color went all the way to 1.0 and kind of mirrored that. So it went like this, went like that like that and then eventually it went like that. Um, and so when we graph those allele frequencies over time what we would find is that um, the values would tend to drift. In other words just due to random chance those allele frequencies are going to change like that or move in, in different directions. And so let me give you some actual data uh, based on that. Let's look here on the internet. And so this is a simulator. It's a population simulator. And so what I can do is I can actually have it do the coin flips inside it. And so we're going to start with a population of 50 right now. And if I just let it run, you'll see that there's going to be random drifting. And so we can think of this as the p-value and this as the q-value. And you can see that it eventually uh, eliminated over time. Now let's try to increase the number though. So let's say we go from 50 to 500 and we reset the population this time. You'll see that there's actually less drift and the reason why we still get a little bit of drift in here is that you have a law of large numbers taking over and so it's less likely to get that change just due to chance. Or let's really make the number large. Let's make it like 5,000 and if I click on go you can see it's going to take a lot longer for my computer to actually do this because um, it takes a while to do all those coin flips. But you can see that there's very little drift. And so one of the things that's going to keep a, a allele um, or a gene pool the same is going to be the, the law of large numbers. So let me talk about what I'm going to talk about. Um, so in this, uh, we know that the gene pool is should remain at equilibrium and if we ever change our gene pool we call that evolution and so in the first two podcasts I talk about natural selection and how natural selection can cause changes in the gene pool in this one I'm dealing with more of these ones up here these things that are based more on random chance because random chance has a lot to do with natural selection as well and the big thing I'm talking about is the size and so if we decrease the size then genetic drift starts to take over so for example let's say we have a population right here and then we have a smaller population that breaks off of that. Maybe they're birds that are blown to an island. Now chance is going to take over and so these two populations are going to start to vary. Two real world examples of genetic drift are the bottleneck effect. Uh, bottleneck effect is when you have a large population and that large population kind of gets squeezed through a bottleneck. In other words, the population is going to get smaller. Even though the population may recover on the other side of that bottleneck, there are going to be huge implications as a result of losing all that genetic diversity. An example 
example I'll talk about is the uh, almost extinction of the northern elephant seal, and that's a human cause. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the founder effect. Uh, founder effect is similar, but essentially it is one founding population making up the, the forming po population. So I'm going to talk about an island in the Pacific called Pingalap, where a founding population made some huge uh, changes in the uh, phenotypes of the offspring that came from that. So this would be genetic drift for a population of 20. As we increase the size, you'll see that less of that is going to be to change. And so when we talk about an isolated population, we could say that this here represents a gene pool, and then all of these colors inside it are going to be the alleles, and maybe it starts with a 50-50 uh, frequency to start with. But once you break off and have smaller isolated populations from that, chance can just take over. And so you could have the elimination just due to chance, not due to adaptation at all. And so example of where this might play out, let's say this is a population of tortoises that float to an island. Um, they're exactly the same as the tortoises on the mainland, but due to just random chance, you're going to get changes to the point where this actually becomes a new species. Now there could be adaptation here as well, but just chance in itself has huge implications when it comes to populations. Let me give you a couple of real world examples of the bottleneck effect uh, and, the, and the founder effect. Uh, bottleneck effect, remember, occurs when the population gets squeezed through a small bottleneck. So these are elephant seals. Elephant seals were hunted almost to extinction. The northern elephant seal live along the west coast of the U.S. down through into Mexico. And their population had dropped down to, some scientists think maybe dropped down to the point of there were just 50 left on one island in Mexico. And so this is in the 1800s. And so their population was squeezed through a huge bottleneck. Um, if you look at the southern elephant seal, the southern elephant seal lives in way down here by Antarctica and didn't see that pressure. Um, they look very similar. They just live in different areas, so they're very closely related. But some scientists, and you can see the citation right here, some scientists took a look at the bottleneck effect and what effect it had on the northern elephant seal. Its population, remember, had gone from uh, a few hundred thousand down to 50, and then it gone up to, I think now it's over 150,000 left. So it had been squeezed through this tiny bottleneck. And so what they did is they actually looked at elephant seals before the bottleneck and after the bottleneck to see how they were affected. Now you might think to yourself, how could we do that? How could we look at them before they actually went extinct, which if it was in the 1800s? Well, what they did is they grabbed a number of skulls from the Smithsonian. So they've got about 11 skulls pre-bottleneck, and then they were able to extract DNA. And so in this case, what they did is they looked at the DNA. They looked at mitochondrial DNA. That's the first thing they did in their study. And what they found is that they had lost a huge amount of genetic diversity. In other words, when they looked at these pre-bottleneck northern elephant seal DNA, there was a huge amount of diversity, but after the bottleneck, they're very, very similar. The second thing they looked at was they wanted to look at symmetry. They wanted to see if that actually can affect the skull itself. Can it affect what they're like? Can it make them less fit phenotypically? And so what they did here to kind of put out the data is that they had, um, here's southern elephant seal, um, here's pre-bottleneck northern elephant seal, and then here's post-bottleneck northern elephant seal. And what they were doing was looking at symmetry, symmetry of the skull. Does the right side look like the left side? And so they measured this value right here on the lower mandible, and they graphed the left mandible distance versus the right mandible distance. And you can see that the southern elephant seals, there's a really nice linear relationship. They then did the same thing with these old skulls from the Smithsonian, and they found that there's a linear relationship as well. And you can see the R values are close to 1, which means it's really close to a linear relationship. But then they looked at the symmetry of the post-bottlenecked um, northern elephant seal, and they find that the data's all over the place. In other words, their skull is very um, asymmetrical. What does that mean? Well, when you decrease the DNA, you're actually having it manifesting itself on the morphology or the outward appearance of the skull. And so that could make them less fit to changes in the environment or more susceptible to uh, another extinction or another bottlenecking effect. Another example related to humans would be the founder effect. So the founder effect um, can happen in any organisms, but the founder effect is when you have a small population that finds a new area or is the founding population of that new area. And so I didn't know about this, but 
Maybe you did. In the, uh, in the South Pacific, we have what's called the Federated States of Micronesia. And in there is a tiny little island called Pingalap. Um, and it was doing well back in the day. But in the 1700s, they had a massive uh, typhoon. And that typhoon swept through Pingalap. And as it did that, it killed almost everybody on the island. So their population dropped down to around 20. So those 20 people were the new founding population of Pingalap. And all the people who live there today are, are uh, descendants of that first 20 people. Now what's interesting is that the leader of Pingalap, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, but the leader of Pingalap, uh, one of these 20 survivors, actually had an odd form of colorblindness where he had complete colorblindness. Um, in other words, when he looked at a, a macaw like this, he sees it in grayscale. Couldn't see any color at all. This is really rare. Something like one in every 33,000 people in the United States have this. But since this was the founding population, very quickly, 5% of the people, and now I think the number's up to around 10% of the people on Pingalap have... Um, complete colorblindness. And that's due to just the random chance in that founding population. Now the number is going higher than it was originally and so that suggests that there's inbreeding as well. And if this is the leader of that population there could have been quite a bit of inbreeding as well. And so that's an example of a founding effect. It's just the chance of who happens to survive or who happens to land on that island or in that one area that can create huge repercussions for the, uh, for the rest of the, the time of that. Uh, population. And so that's uh, genetic drift. Again, it's just randomness, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the smaller the population is. I hope that's helpful.